all the floor is yours and your co-presenters. So thank you so much for agreeing to do this, Gail. Well, thanks for inviting me. This is really fun because this uh, webinar really embodies two of my very favorite subjects as, a, as an educator. Um, uh, you may know me already as a, an assistive technology specialist and a consultant to the uh, ECHO and AT project, but what you may not know is that for about 15 years, I served on the state of Oregon's uh, state level transition team. And so um, it's, it's always a pleasure for me to try and meld those two topics Put them together and um, share what I know. I do want to invite you today, all of you, to um, to have a conversation. This is an important topic. Um, my my friend in Pennsylvania says the reason we do assistive technology is because of transition. So um, we hopefully the assistive technology work we do in our lives helps our students be more independent and more self-sufficient and more self-determined. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, before I switch to sharing my screen, I would love to have some feedback from you. Um, so I, I think I can see everybody right this minute. How many of you work primarily with uh, students in the K-12 or the, the in the K-12 education system. So will you just raise your hand? Okay. Oh, and so, thank you. And how many of you work primarily with um, people who have finished high school and, and are, are primarily getting adult services? Okay. So, uh, and then there's a group who I think must be working with all ages. If you're working with all ages, raise your hand. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna share the screen now. Uh, while I do that, I wanna say one of the challenges about talking about assistive technology and transition is that we, um, Many of us come from a particular perspective. We either come from the perspective of um, assistive technology or we come from the perspective of uh, transition. And so what I'm going to do first up is to, uh, in this session, to talk about uh, just the basic rules about assist, about assistive technology that are included in um, in law, and then I uh, also was looking for a way to talk about assistive technology laws in uh, rules in Wyoming. So uh, Canyon helped me invite. We have four special guests today, and so the next slide shows you who they are. We have Janine Cole. Um, she's Wyoming Department of Education Outreach for Deaf of Hard of Hearing Supervisor. We have Jennifer Heiler, um, who is Wyoming Department of Education Continuous Improvement, the lead consultant for that project. And we have Nikki Harper and Ann Armel, who are uh, transition consultants with the Wyoming Department of Education Workforce Services, so the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. Um, we had some conversations before this session today and talked about uh, who was going to address what on a, in our slide presentation. Uh, but I want to invite all of you, and especially these four folks who are experts on Wyoming services, to jump in anytime. One of the things I love about Zoom is that you can um, have a conversation while you're doing a presentation like this. It's easy for us to talk with each other. So you know how to unmute yourself. And uh, if I hear a voice, I'll stop and find out who it is that's, that's gonna have a conversation. Uh, so let's get started. Um, we, we sort of did this already, so I'm gonna skip this slide. Usually I use it um, as a as a poll in a webinar that I do on this topic. But what I want to point
point out to you is that the number of perspectives about assistive technology um, as and a transition just increases exponentially as uh, as we think about transitions for for students from the K-12 system to adult services and or to adult life. Um, you could be any one of the people listed uh, on this list and for each of you there will be some uh, no matter what your role there will be some real specific um, information about assistive technology and transition. When I uh, when I do a full webinar series on this topic, it's usually four or five or even six different webinars so that we can talk about um, not only the big picture ideas, but also uh, how those big picture ideas apply to different educational settings like post-secondary and college, like uh, group homes or supported work environments. Uh, and um, so there's a whole range of things we could talk about. It's a huge topic. And um, what I want to try to do today is to just give you an overview of some of the big picture ideas that are included when we think about assistive technology and transitions. So the big ideas are um, are these and the and the presentation today is divided into these three big ideas. So first of all, post school outcomes and assistive technology, knowing in your transition planning not only what the outcomes, the the post school goals will be for a particular individual as we do transition planning, but also the ways that assistive technology um, fits into those the accomplishment of those post-school outcomes, not only acquiring the assistive technology, but also doing the kinds of things that help a student to continue to use their assistive technology when they leave the school setting. We'll also talk about some important concepts that we discovered in a, uh, in a grant project that I was a part of in the middle and late 1990s that gave us uh, some basic information about what's important to think about uh, when we think about assistive technology and transition. So we'll talk about helping students develop assistive technology skills for independence um, and also independent assistive technology skills and then uh, assistive technology self-determination, how those two things fit together. So that's the big picture of what we're gonna do today, but let's look at some of the background information. The uh, National Longitudinal Transition Studies, the federal government has done a series of these studies. And if you're a transition person, you, um, you may well be aware of these various studies that were done. The, the second study looked at primarily at outcomes for students who were leaving the public schools and um, going on to different, different kinds of adult life and uh, compared youth with disabilities to the general population. What I hope you can see from this chart is, um, it is not so much the specifics of some of these items, but the fact that our students with disabilities, our youth with disabilities who leave the public school system are much less likely to be successful with these indicators that you see on the chart. So they're less likely to enroll in post-secondary, any kind of a post-secondary educational program. They're less likely to enroll in four-year colleges. They're, uh, they're less likely to hold jobs for a long period of time, to use a checking account, to use a credit card, or even to be working. These statistics are um, pretty abysmal the way they are, but when you think about the fact that these statistics um, are statistics about kids with all kinds of disabilities, not, not any particular group of dis, uh, of kids with a particular disability. So not just kids with, who are deaf, 
hard of hearing or kids with vision impairments, um, but also students with learning disabilities and, um, and individuals who may even just have had a, a particular uh, articulation disorder, some kind of speech disorder. So the, the numbers don't look great for the population of, of youth with disabilities in general. And if you, if you uh, divide the, the populations that were included in this study by disability, you'll see that some groups um, are even less successful in terms of post-school life. Um, so what do we do about that? And that was the question that the, uh, the National Longitudinal Ed Outcome Study uh, address. What are we going to do about that? And we've seen a huge emphasis in the last few years on making changes to improve these statistics and, and um, provide additional opportunities to our students with disabilities. I want to, this is the point in time when I want to talk about transition in terms of IDEA and assistive technology. So if you are a transition person, this is a definition that you may not be totally familiar with. If you're an assistive technology person, you're probably very familiar with this definition. And I have discovered sort of by accident one day that I can uh, recite this whole, I've memorized it, I can recite this whole definition of assistive technology because that's where I spend a great deal of my time. The important factor here is that assistive technology is any item that's, and I'm not going to read you the definition, but that's used to increase, maintain, or improve functional capabilities of a child with a disability. And that, uh, that definition is um, is modified just a little bit to say that it does not include medical devices that are surgically implanted or the replacement of a device like that. So assistive technology in schools um, includes all kinds of different devices that help improve a child's function, a student's function. It doesn't include cochlear implants. It does not include um, medication pumps like insulin pumps or uh, other medication pumps that are uh, considered medical devices. So the reason that's important to know is that assistive technology in IDEA, in the special education law, is a requirement for students who need it. And every team that creates an IEP for an individual child has to consider whether or not the child needs assistive technology. Now they may say no, that there isn't any uh, assistive technology that a particular student needs, but the conversation is required in every IEP meeting. Um, when the definition mentions improving, increasing, or maintaining the functional capabilities of a child with a disability, we often think about functional capabilities like these, reading, writing, hearing, seeing, self-care, things like that. And so when an IEP team has a meeting, what they do is they discuss, um, is, uh, does this, student need assistive technology to help with communication? Does the student need assistive technology to help with math? And um, those are the kinds of conversations that happen in IEP meetings around the country every day. When we start to think about students who are in transition, however, what we want to begin to think about is functional capabilities in a different way. So here's a different list of functional capabilities um, that I like to use when I'm thinking about the topic of transition. Does the technology that a student is using increase their level of independence? Does it improve the quality of life? Um, is, a, is a student more productive because they use assistive technology? 
Will they be more successful because they use assistive technology, more successful in adult life? And finally, the last bullet on this list, does assistive technology reduce the amount of support that a particular person needs so that they can be more independent in their own lives and more uh, self-determined? IDEA also lists assistive technology services. These are services that schools are required to provide and because you know uh, water and the wind program and, and possibly assistive technology programs in your own area or your own school district, you may be familiar with this list of, of evaluating the need for assistive technology, providing the devices. Schools are required to provide assistive technology if the IEP team determines that it's needed. And, uh, a, a number of other services that all uh, revolve around making sure that the assistive technology is useful for a particular child. So these services are very device specific, except for the, the number five and number six services, which are about training and technical assistance, both for the child and the child's family and for professionals. Um, it's important to have that background because I think it has huge implications for how we deal with assistive technology when we start to think about the, the uh, school to community transitions that our, our students will be experiencing. If you're an assistive technology person, you may not be familiar with the definitions in IDEA for transition services. So this is the wording directly out of the uh, federal special education law. And um, the requirement is that for any student um, at, at the latest age 16, or so age 16 and over, transition services must be provided. So it's another part of every IEP meeting for a student who is uh, 16 years or older. Transition services is planning that is designed to be in a results-oriented process that's focusing on improving the academic and functional achievement of the child with a disability to make sure that that transition happens um, easily and effectively. It's also required that the transition services be customized based on the child's individual needs and take into account the, the students' strengths and preferences. Now, I'm saying child here a lot, and there's probably a couple of you who are, are uh, cringing a little bit every time I say that. But that's because, uh, the reason I'm saying child is because that is the wording in IDEA. We realize that for the population we're talking about, what we're really talking about is young adults and youth. Um, but the wording in IDEA does reflect the uh, child's individual needs. One of the reasons I'm sort of okay with that is because I think that for many of our students, that transition planning has to happen um, earlier than we may have thought in the past. The law requires that it start at age 16, no later than age 16, and that's federal law. Um, but in fact, particularly for assistive technology, we may want it to start uh, even earlier. So those services have to start by the age of 18, of 16, uh, be updated annual, annually and include measurable post-secondary goals. So things that you can tell if a student has accomplished in the same way that IEP goals have to be measurable and observable. One of the really important things to know about the difference between the IDEA rules, all of the, we've looked at IDEA so far, and all of those rules are requirements for every school district in the country. Wyoming may have, or does have a few um, alternative rules and additional requirements for your students with disabilities. Um, and we'll talk about those in just a minute. But what's important to know in this um, webinar is that 
Um, the idea is an entitlement law. It's a law that says every single kid who goes to a public school is entitled to all of these things if they need them, and the agency has to find those kids who need them and provide the service. Adult services are different, and that's a thing that um, it's really important that parents of uh, students with disabilities understand, and I think it's one of the big responsibilities that schools have in terms of providing effective transition services is to help parents understand that when a student leaves uh, the high school program at whatever age they do that, adult services are based on eligibility. So if you have a, if you're a parent and you have a child who needs, for instance, vocational rehabilitation services or funding from vocational rehabilitation, you, your child has to go and ask for those services. No one will go and seek them out. Um, you know, the, the grapevine is a wonderful thing, but, and often we know about the students in our, particularly in our small communities who need for kinds of services, but a, an adult, a student who is considered an adult, has to apply for services in the adult, um, in the adult arena. So it's eligibility rather than entitlement that it goes into play here. And that's a huge change for kids who go to college, for kids who need group homes, whatever the service that an individual might need, um, it's a self-referral process. So idea planning, uh, AT planning for transition in IDEA has to meet certain legal requirements, but for the rest of our time together, what I'm hoping we can really discuss is how to ensure that there's continuity of AT use in new environments. When we, um, when I first began doing work in assistive technology and transition, one of the things we found over and over again was that we knew uh, students who had very effectively use their assistive technology in the high school setting and um, you know could use it in a functional way could use it independently uh, were good capable users of assistive technology but when they left the entitlement services provided under IDEA and moved to that eligibility um, arena in, a, in services for adults, we saw them um, abandon their technology in many different ways. So some of the information I'm going to provide today came from a grant where we investigated the reasons for that. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So commonly, when, we, when, when I say assistive technology and transition to folks, the questions that come up are very much about uh, assistive technology devices. Is uh, How will we get a device for a student who's going to leave the school setting and become an adult? What about transfer of technology? Is there funding for devices for our students with disabilities when they move to the adult services arena? And is there funding for the support services they might need? For instance, is there funding for a speech and language clinician to help reprogram a communication device five years after the student leaves the school setting. So those are common AT questions. When we began to talk about um, how the folks from Wyoming were gonna um, be able to, we're gonna contribute to this webinar and have a conversation um, about assistive technology in Wyoming specific rules, one of the things that became apparent is that um, many of the rules that we're focusing on, uh, many of the rules that you have in Wyoming were designed to address some of these common questions. So, what, so let's talk about transfer of equipment as it applies to Wyoming. Let's talk about the Wyoming Memorandum, Memorandum of Understanding that's being developed as we speak, and let's talk about 
uh, WIOA, I think that's how you pronounce that acronym. Um, and so here's where I get to be quiet. And I think each of you has, each of our guests today has a particular part to talk about. So I'm gonna just let you unmute yourself. And who's up to talk about I'll the uh, transition step? I'll start first, Gail. Basically what we want to articulate today is what's in the draft MOU that we currently have. But it, as part of that is what, what you and I had talked about early on or last week when we met was we do have in statute currently within our districts that if a, if a student goes, moves from one district to another and they're using the, um, they can take that assistive technology with them if the district does not need it for another student and typically how it works then is that the receiving district will pay the um, depreciation value of that equipment. So this is something that we're, I, it's my understanding we wanna get a better understanding of how that would work in terms of in transition and then post, either going on to post-secondary to um, school or work. And that's something that we are exploring in, with the MOU. And then Jennifer has more about the MOU, as do, as do Nikki and Ann. Okay, so let me move to the MOU. Okay. So as, yeah, as Janine said, the MOU that um, is currently in draft form um, is, uh, it, it has had some extensive time kind of devoted to it as far as both Department of um, Education and Workforce Services, DVR, looking at it and so for the most part the content that's in there is is it's been vetted it's you know we've we've come together and looked at it now it's just kind of going through the formal process of um, having having lawyers and and those types of folks look at it but really when you look at the um, within the MOU the the big piece that I kind of always turn to quickly um, is uh, three components of a section that's the joint WDE and DVR and those three components are training technical assistance collaboration and outreach and that really outlines the work between the two agencies um, and I, I can give some examples but they're pretty straightforward as far as you know training would look just like Department of Ed and DVR doing some collaborative training um, or okay. else additional training so you know that's kind of that those are the three big uh, pieces of the of the MOU that I would say for our districts for LEAs is going to be um, the piece that will affect them the most okay and if you're not aware of the term MOU MOU is a memorandum of understanding it's a commonly used Sorry. Uh, across the country for agreements between two or more uh, uh, usually state agencies but two or more agencies and it's basically a description of how they will work together so thank you Gail. Um, do we have any information about when this MOU is anticipated to be formally released um. No, not, no, I can't, <laughs> no. Okay. We're meeting this week, if that helps. That helps a lot. <laughs> it helps, you know, it, it's kind of going through those final stages of just getting, like I said, the, the formality pieces to it. The content, uh, the content has been vetted and, and the, the two agencies <clears throat> have definitely taken time to look at it, collaborate on it, agree on it. Um, now it's just going through that. I, I hate to put a time frame on it because some of those things can just yeah, take longer. <laughs> yeah. So. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. No, that's okay. I wish I could say a date. If I could say a date, I totally would, but probably in, here in the near future. So when things are vetted, that means a, a whole lot of people have to look at them and, and they do everything from identify an area where, you know, some attorney may say, oh my gosh, you can't do that. Or sometimes it's like change the word and to However, or you know, I mean, the, it, the vetting process is uh, 
is a very careful project process. So we will uh, look forward to hearing more about that. And I'm sure that as soon as there is an official MOU, we'll know about it. Um, who's going to talk about this? Thing? So can I ask a question? Yes. So working at the local um, district level and hearing that and thinking of some of the questions that were coming up, um, I think it makes sense. I don't know what that would look like if I have, I, I know a colleague of mine down the road had a student who required some very specific equipment and the student left within a couple of months and he had to keep the equipment and it was, it was just kind of a, a waste. It would be nice if, and so he even said, can we transfer that to another district who may have that need? And so that makes sense. It's all federal monies. But the follow-up question, when we're starting to work with DVR, with the waiver, and things like that, one thing, and I guess I want to know if I'm thinking about this wrong, um, is that what I've done, especially when our students get older and we start looking at a piece of equipment that's going to possibly stay with the child or the student going forward, we start looking at alternative ways to fund it so they can start using it in their life. And we know that we have a lot of limitations within the district. To, to, to hold on to those things that we cannot. And I've noticed that when I bring those conversations up, sometimes they're met with some resistance with some of these agencies, because when a student is in school, they want and expect this district, um, because I think there's a perceived deep pockets for us to be purchasing a lot of those things. But at some point, I think what we need to talk about in this transition, I like to call it a soft handoff a handoff to these agencies. We should be working with these agencies when these students are 19, 20, 21 years of age so that they go right into services. And a lot of time that's not happening. So the DVR worker, these other agencies they're gonna be part of should start like working with the school and we should start you know, transitioning them in so they have a very easy transition into their adult world. And I don't know if that's really happening right now and I think a lot of it has to do with money in my opinion of who's paying for what and like you know I've heard comments like you know we, we don't pay for anything if the student is in school and I've, I've found out if they're in school and it, it would be used during that time then they're not allowed to pay for it you hear different things and I found out that's not to really be true and so I think we need to get with those agencies and say, what are the rules? Who can pay for what? And currently we have a really good DVR worker where we are um, collaborating more and they're picking up the device. We'll train them on that. So we're really working together as we're, as we're getting them workforce ready because it is important. We train them on this, all this technology and then they don't go use it in their real world. Um, Let me interrupt you because um, the next thing we want to talk about is this Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. It's a relatively new development and it may be part of the reason why you're seeing increased um, collaboration and, uh, and uh, funding from your DVR person. So who's going to talk about this one? Is it Nikki? I will, yes. So this is Nikki. And thank you for mentioning that you're working well with the VR Council. We always like to hear that. And yes, to speak to, you know, trying to get things, um, soft handoff kind of thing, that is something we're developing with WDE, actually. That is part of the MOU, where if the student is utilizing that technology, and as Gail mentioned on slide eight, if we can show the um, that that person can use it to increase functional capabilities in post um, post uh, high school. It, it's just easier for us to justify that. But we are trying to have conversations and, you know, sometimes we have a great agreement with WDE, but 48 school districts in Wyoming do things 48 different ways. <laughs> so sometimes that gets a little challenging. But our goal is to have something pretty firm in an MOU that says, if the student has this and you paid $5,000, it's depreciated X number of dollars, we'll take it over because the student can continue to use this. And by the time the next person comes along, this technology is pretty much ancient and the next person's not going to benefit from it and so on and so forth. But getting back to um, Viova, because I told Gail that I only needed three minutes, three to five minutes and I can talk I, super fast. 
I knew better than that. Keep going. <laughs> That's okay. But um, they're really um, workforce innovation and opportunity act. So I really like to emphasize on the innovation and the opportunity. It's there are significant changes for uh, for DBR. Um, we're really uh, in some uncharted territories. Just things are things are. We're going to have to do business a little bit different. Um, we're you know creating a lot of partnerships and hence. Um, more emphasis on, uh, we, we did have a partnership with WDE before, but this time around, it's more hands-on. We're actually getting together, working together. It's, it's really great to see um, some of the outcomes that we've already had. And um, our biggest focus is just for time's sake is, um, I hate the acronym PETS, but essentially pre-employment transition services where and that's another reason you'll probably start seeing your work rehab counselors more in the schools. We are trying to get out there, trying to serve um, students with disabilities. And in terms of the assistive tech, um, counselors are pretty much going to say, you know, it really depends on the student. Everything is individualized. But I think from the school's perspective, if they can start um, and I, you know, in the past, we've probably said, okay, if they're in school, it's probably the school's responsibility because it's for educational purposes. But again, if we can come together and have that conversation about how is this going to, you know, help this person post high school, really highlighting those functional capabilities that why the, um, why it makes sense for the tech to go along with the students. And if we can come to an agreement so that's something I think um, WDE and Work Rehab will continue to, to work on. Um, and basically in terms of um, the AT Act, it used to be under RSA, who Work Rehab is housed under. But it has, uh, with VOA legislation, um, it was um, moved to the Department of Health under the administration of community living. So as far as Wyoming goes, that would technically be under um, WIL. So we really need, we probably need to partner with them and kind of try to figure out what's going on. I'm not really certain on where we stand with that because it, I was also made to understand that the governor of each state has a right to move that from whatever department they feel fit. So I, I don't know where it would it'll land so that we could potentially see some changes with that but again we are trying to work with other departments and like I said you know WDE is just one of them it would be great for us to try to get this going with um, I saw Betty on with DOC and WIL and so on and so forth so anyway I will shush and let you guys continue um, do you have any questions especially I'm not sure the gentleman mayor who ha um, had questions about us trying to do stuff with work rehab. If you have additional questions or ideas, please feel free to make contact with us. And because sometimes it's great to hear from the field and what the field folks have to say that just sometimes makes sense. So thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Um, yep. One final thing about the WIO, um, this act is that um, one of the big differences in this act was that there is um, a certain amount of money that um, must yes. be allocated. I'm sorry, I didn't mention that. The so 15 percent. Yes. So Boca Rehab is now required to spend some of their funds on transition services, and that's making a huge difference uh, across the country in terms of uh, what's available and how they do things. So that's uh, an important thing to know. If I may interject real quick. Unfortunately, we that out of the 15%, we can't buy AT or we can, AT devices are not part of the services that we can provide under that 15%. We have five very specific services and then nine additional services. Okay. But so hopefully, maybe, sorry? Maybe in the future we could have um, Another webinar just about that act. Um, I, I am a little bit concerned about time, so I want to move on. Yes. Um, and uh, get to the rest of our content. But all of these acts, all the memorandum of understanding, the, uh, the existing rules that you have about transfer of technology from agency to agency and the, and the full funding of assistive technology in Wyoming, all of those things come together to make a package 
that helps us get devices. Um, I also wanted to mention to you that there's one final uh, federal action. This is actually an Oregon civil action, an ADA case that was just settled last month. Um, but it talks about services for students, uh, for uh, people with uh, severe developmental disabilities. And again, that um, the service model is changing so that they're, um, they're developing a whole lot more um, opportunities, a whole lot more um, ability to make a choice. But if you want to work in a sheltered workshop or you want some other kind of uh, integrated employment. This was an Oregon case, but it was a settlement with the federal government. And what we anticipate is that we're going to see an increase in services for students with um, intellectual disabilities, as well as some of the vocational rehabilitation services um, that you're hearing about from, uh, from Nikki. However, I want to change the uh, the focus here a little bit, because I think it's really important to know that it's not just the funding of devices that makes for a smooth transition. This list of factors is um, from a book by uh, on augmentative communication by David Buchelman and Pat Miranda, and they list these five things that affect whether or not somebody is gonna use their assistive technology system in whatever environment it is. What's important to recognize is that in a transition from school to community, all of those five things change. Um, the individual needs and skills of the student change because they're no longer in an academic setting, but they're in some other kind of setting. The opportunities to use their assistive technology change. There'd be different opportunities, maybe more, maybe less, but different opportunities. The environmental demands, the attitudes of the people around them about assistive technology and the support available. Um, only thing that stays the same is the person who uses the assistive technology. So these are photos of my friend William when he was in the fourth grade. He was a, a user of assistive technology and he had a lot of good assistive technology skills. The photo on the right is William when he graduated from high school. He graduated summa cum laude from his high school still using his assistive technology because it was such an important and functional tool for him. So I was involved in a research project a few years ago that asked the question, what are the factors that make a difference for students like William? Now, William left high school with his own personal assistive technology. He had a laptop, he had um, Kurzweil, I believe, uh, software, something that read text to him uh, and allowed him to write uh, with his assistive technology. Um, but just the fact that you have your own assistive technology when you leave high school is not enough to ensure success in a transition like that. So uh, I was involved in a project called Project Tech Trans um, that looked at what is it that, that does make for success. And what we found was there were three factors. So we used this tripod icon as, a, as an analogy for the three factors that make for successful assistive technology transitions. Um, the reason we use a tripod is because if you don't have all three things, all three legs of this assistive technology model, the whole thing falls over. So you have to do a big balancing act and everything sort of tips over. We researched by uh, talking to uh, about 40 students who had left high school using assistive technology to find out whether or not they were still using it. And if, if they were, what were the important um, factors in their assistive technology use? And so we came up with um, some really interesting research about that. And what I wanna do for the rest of our time together is to give you a summary of that. 
The first one and the most important one, and I think the one that has the most significant implications for, um, for school folks is that the student needs to have skills for independence. One of the things that happens way too often is um, that we provide assistive technology to our students, but then we, um, we walk them through every day all the steps they're supposed to take in order to use their assistive technology. So um, what we hope is that our students who use assistive technology, particularly at the high school level, can do it without a lot of adult support because that is what they're gonna have to do when they leave the public school setting. Um, uh, one of the most useful paradigms for thinking about that and what we have to teach our students who use assistive technology is one that's adapted from the work of Janice Light, who is a, a augmentative communication specialist. So uh, she talks about the, the fact that there are four skill areas that are important to have for um, effective augmentative communication use, but I've adapted that paradigm to say, there really have to be four skill areas um, for any kind of assistive technology use. So you see them listed here. Students need to know how to operate their assistive technology, do things like turn it on and off, but they also have to know how to, to do the thing for which the technology was selected. So in an IEP meeting, we say an, a student needs assistive technology for communication. A student needs assistive technology for writing, for getting information from text. Um, and the goal for all of our students is that they be able to operate their device as independently as possible, and that they be able to use it in a functional way, in a real world, meaningful way, um, to help them be more independent. Students also need to know strategically when and where to use their assistive technology, when they need to use an augmentative communication device and when they may need some lower tech system or even a no, a no tech system for communicating. When do you use a pen? When do you use your computer? When do you use a voice recognition for your writing task? Those are things that not that we identify as educators, but sometimes neglect to teach our students. So that's an important skill to teach. And then also social skills, how to talk about your own assistive technology and use it with around other people in a, in a way that is uh, not invasive or intrusive. So there's some, I'm gonna walk through these pretty quickly. Here's some sample operational skills, how to set up your own hardware, operate the device without help, troubleshoot, purchase supplies for your assistive technology. Functional skills are more in the area of doing things. So determining what your task is, uh, what parts of the task will require assistive technology in the old environment or the new environment and determining how it will be included in your everyday routines. When will you use it? Where will it be in the room? Simple things like that. Strategic skills for, for assistive technology transitions help are skills that you have to have to know when to use your AT, when to use something else. Um, and figure out when you might need a new device. When do you need a new wheelchair? When do you need a new computer? And how do you acquire it if you do need it? And finally, that social skill area that we've talked about, how do you ask for help on a job site? Help with the AT? Or how do you use the AT to ask for help? Um, how do you identify your own environmental accommodations that are needed? Um, things like that. And I'm sure if you think of a particular student, you'll be able to identify skills in each of these four areas that will, um, that are the next thing that you'd like the person you're working with to learn in order to become more independent. What Janice Light says about this 
these four skill areas is that um, if if there's something going not going well with an assistive technology program, it's more than likely that one of these areas is lacking. So the student um, may be able to use their know how to operate their technology and use it for functional things, but doesn't know when to use it or when to use a different tab. So it's a good way to look at what's happening with assistive technology and see how it makes a difference. The second leg of that tripod that we talked about in the Tech Trans program was self-determination. And this was the critical factor that, as an assistive technology specialist, I really hadn't thought very much about. Self-determination is defined by Michael Wehmeyer as uh, the attitudes and abilities required to act as the primary causal agent in your own life. And I love that concept of being the primary causal agent in your own life, the person that makes things happen for yourself. We found that students who were good independent users of assistive technology and had good transition plans tended to abandon their technology if they weren't able to advocate for it on their own or or had a person who would advocate for the use of the technology specifically in their life. So what does self-determination look like? Self-determination, self-determined students act autonomously. They can regulate their own performance. They feel empowered, they're psychologically empowered and they act in ways that help them reach their own goals. Um, they're, they're, um, they believe that they have control over their own lives and they're aware of what they're good at and what they're not so good at and where they need help. Michael Waymeyer talks about the elements of self-determination, so making choices, making decisions, problem solving, goal setting and attainment skills, self-regulation and self-management, and then self-advocacy. We, um, I, it'd be fun to do an entire webinar on just self-determination and assistive technology, but let's give you some examples of what self-determination and assistive technology might look like. And let me say too, that for anybody that we're working with, whether they're in a K-12 program or in a, an adult service uh, environment or environment where they're getting adult services, um, there's a whole range of skills and everyone has some things that they're good at and some things that they're um, just developing their skill at and may need additional help. So um, what I did was I took each of these bullet points and I, I have um, some quotes from some of the students that I worked in the, with in the past that sort of illustrate their own um, their self-determination skills. So Gordon was a student who said, I don't wear my hearing aids to dances. And he had made that choice and he could articulate why he made that choice. So students who are self-determined can make their own choices about their AG devices and services. And we can teach choice making. We can teach what that looks like and it gives your students an opportunity to practice it. Students who use assistive technology and are self-determined can make decisions about their AT. And Waymeyer makes the distinction between choice making and decision making in that choices are things that you get to have every single day. Today, do I wear my hearing aids or not? Today, do I take my wheelchair or do I walk with my crutches? Um, decisions have more of a long-term impact. So a, a self-determined assistive technology user will be able to not only make choices for the short term, but decisions for the long term. Um, students who are self-determined can solve AT problems. They can identify when there is a problem and know either how to fix it or how to ask for help. And we can teach problem solving. Um, students who are self-determined can set assistive technology goals. I, they, here's the next thing I want to learn about the use of assistive technology, or here's the next assistive technology device that I'd like to 
to acquire. I had a friend who, my friend Jason used to call me about every two years and say, oh, it's time for me to get a new computer. And then I'd help him work with his folk rehab counselor to, to justify why he needed it. Students who are self-determined can regulate and manage their own assistive technology use. They can figure out when they need, um, uh, when they need to use their assistive technology, decide to use it, or figure out a different way to, to accomplish the task they need to accomplish. And finally, students are, who are self-determined can take a leadership role and advocate for their own quality of life and for their own assistive technology use. Um, Clara was a high school student who wanted to uh, work in a medical setting, but she had uh, no legs. And so she determined that it, as part of her transition, she needed a, a wheelchair that would help her uh, raise and lower her body so that she could um, reach the, the, the tools that she needed to do her job. And she ran her own meetings to identify and acquire that, that specialized wheelchair so that she could go on to a post-secondary program. What we know about students who are self-determined is that they're twice as likely to be employed as people with low levels of self-determination. They're more likely to earn a higher salary and they're more likely to have a job that has benefits and such as sick leave and insurance. So self-determination is a very important aspect of assistive technology. And as we think about assistive technology and transition planning, one of the things that's really crucial is that we address the assistive technology during the planning, the, the total transition planning um, process. Here's a list of some self-determination assessments that you can take a look at if you're interested in this topic. These are all free and online. The third factor in our, in our tech trans tripod of, approach was good transition planning. Um, so IDEA talks about a coordinated set of activities designed to facilitate the child's movement from school to post-school activities. That coordinated set of activities could address any of these topics, but the message that, uh, that I wanna leave you with today is that if you aren't planning on thinking about assistive technology as you develop this coordinated set of activities, as you plan for a student's future, um, you're, you're missing the boat and it's more likely that the student will abandon their technology as they leave the school settings. So in our session today, we've talked about some big ideas. I want to leave you with, uh, with these thoughts, which are that just because a student uses assistive technology in school and uses it well does not necessarily mean that that assistive technology use will carry over to new environments. There are specific skills for students of every age that can be learned and applied to transitions that include assistive technology. And as you plan that coordinated set of activities for students from age 16 and beyond, it's really important that those activities include a focus on assistive technology. So um, I'm gonna stop there. I wanna invite you to ask questions or comment um, there's a lot to talk about here, and so this has been just a very brief overview. I hope that it gave you some ideas of things to think about, and please, I want to invite you to, um, to contact me if you heard things today that you'd like to know more about. I, I have a whole bunch of resources and ideas that I'd be happy to share with you. So, thanks. Wonderful, Gail. Thank you so much for presenting today, and and um, you know you're always been part of the AT work here in Wyoming, and this is a great um, opportunity to transition you into talking about transition. Uh -huh.
Pun <laughs> absolutely intended. So what questions or comments do individuals have on the line? We'll go ahead and unmute. It looks like a couple of other individuals who have joined us on the phone line, but we'll go ahead and unmute the phone lines as well. I'm going to stop sharing so everybody can see everybody, but we can pull it back if we need to. Great. So any other questions or comments? Um, I think these are great overarching concepts to think about as, as you know, we move to try and improve transition and, and, and figure out the role that AT plays um, in that. But any other comments, questions? I guess just to, to follow up with my comment from earlier, um, I'm glad to hear that that's being looked at with the WDE and those different divisions, because that has been a barrier in the past, not to be able to have a student take their device. And it's, you know, and like they, like they articulated, it depreciates in value. It usually sits on a shelf. And a lot of times I think a lot of people would just prefer just to give them to it. But, you know, we have to, we have federal requirements that require us to tag and be responsible for those materials. So, I'm glad to hear that that's being addressed. I think that that'll help a lot. I think um, to comment, because as, as it was stated, there's 47, 48 different districts and different departments that have to work. Clear guidelines would be really helpful and going through those so you don't have individuals. So that's what I would suggest, making sure it's clear so people knew um, what those rules were and what they're not. So, do you mind through the chat just sending me your contact information? Yeah, Nikki Dan is with is with Uinta. You went to one. You went to one. He's a special ed director. Okay, thank you. Great. Dan, this is Janine. I appreciate your comments. I to be continued, but we're we're glad that you're on and and are discussing this. And and we've started. I mean, we've you know we're we're having those conversations with our fiscal folks at the Department of Ed, and and I agree. We 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 need to have that guidance and that's it now the timing's here and so that's one thing that we're going to work on with DVR Department of Ed Finance all of us and to give you guys um, the the clear guidance so there's not 48 different ways so thanks thanks for bringing it up and thanks for being on we appreciate it well most right. importantly I just wanted to say real quick I am the transition consultant that covers the western half so if you have questions, my email's on like slide two or three, please feel free to get a hold of me and we'll see what we can do on the western half with Uinta County. Thank you. Great, so I'll go ahead and um, with everybody who entered in their email address as well, I'll go ahead and forward out the slides um, that Gail presented in addition to a short survey, but then everybody should have others contact information. and. Um, and this webinar, although we made it available to the whole state, it was targeting the individuals who are on our UW Echo, Echo and Secondary Transition planning group. And so this can be a continued conversation, right, and an opportunity that as we decide, okay, here's the MOU, here's the clear guidance, we could use that platform to once again speak to this group as well as invite individuals from the state. So, you know, Janine and Jennifer and Nikki and Ann, you guys are all on the planning committee and we can have those conversations um, as we go forward and figure out when is the time as soon as, as, soon as you guys know, um, given that most of those regular sessions will start probably in March. So um, other comments or questions um, that we have Gail and, and, and the rest of the individuals on the line, on the line, there I go again. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd just like to say thank you, Gail, for joining us, and, and thanks, everybody, for, for putting together this webinar. Um, for those of you who are involved in the Secondary Transition Group, we will be meeting next week at 2 o'clock. Um, and really, we have gotten some really good feedback on opportunities for additional um, kind of didactic training, so it'll be part of that UW ECHO session. But we really do need some feedback on what kind of case presentation documents, what kind of consistent cases do you guys want to discuss as part of the secondary transition? So please go ahead and send those out. And it looks like Gail has a comment. Go ahead. You know, I forgot to say, um, in, uh, in the handouts that you will be getting um, after this webinar, there is a transition planning worksheet. Mm -hmm. um, that it is about assistive technology, but it was developed by the uh, quality indicators for assistive technology services folks. And I'm gonna pull it up here, but you should have 
have a, a, a transition planning worksheet like this in the packet that you get. It addresses all of the different areas that we've talked about for assistive technology. It might be something uh, that you could modify for your um, for your case presentation stuff. Uh, in a di I realize your cases won't be about assistive technology, but I wanted to point out that worksheet. Wonderful. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and send these out with a copy of the PowerPoints. And if individuals on that planning group would be willing to go ahead and look at that, look at your own transition documents and really bring those to our meeting next week. Um, hopefully we can we can get this, you know, community is already here. Those are most of the members who are on today, but continue to build this community and in, in supporting transition. So thanks again, everybody. Um, if we don't have any other comments or questions, I think we'll sign off and look forward to continuing conversations about improving transitions in Wyoming. Bye, everybody. Bye, thank you. Thank you.